All right, welcome to Book by Book tonight. To, we are going to be uh, walking through Isaiah 18 through 21. Um, and the uh, chapters are a little shorter. And so that's why we're doing four instead of three today. Uh, but also there is a good break um, as we, 22 starts looking at a message to Jerusalem. And so we've been dealing with the nations um, and so we'll continue walking through uh, the nations tonight and then look at a shift towards Jerusalem uh, tomorrow. And so for the last uh, last week, we looked at um, the, the prophecy against uh, the enemies of the people of God. And that word for prophecy can also be translated as burden. Uh, and so to just to keep in mind that the prophet was not like, yeah, get him. Um, and we'll even see, it wasn't like something he enjoyed sharing. It was a, it was a heavy message that he was bringing to the people. And his primary audience is not these nations. Uh, his primary audience is, is the people of Jerusalem. And they need to hear that the Lord is sovereign over all of the nations. And part of the challenge that they have is they know that there's this, this looming threat of the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire someday. The, Isaiah talks about that, that rising up. And, and so we need to be uh, mindful that the, um, I'm sorry, the, I'm just going to turn off the, the AI person on my computer real quick. I always forget to do it because I, and that I never use it. So I'm just going to turn it off. So it stops thinking that I'm talking when I am mentioning Assyria. So uh, there we go. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the temptation for the people in Jerusalem is that they would align themselves with one of these other nations. Um, and what the Lord's message today that we will be reminded of is uh, all of those nations are subservient to the Lord, and he is uh, able to bring them up as well as bring them down. And so that's part of what, why he, these words are coming to the people of Jerusalem, is to remember that they need to trust the Lord, not idols and not other nations, and, and, and making alliances with uh, those other folks. And so that's, um, that's the key thing as we're walking through here. Um, and as we think about, <clears throat> we think we're going to look a lot at uh, Egypt today. Um, and as we think about Egypt, we should also be remembering that the people of Israel came out of Egypt. And uh, and so when we are, when the when the people are tempted to look to Egypt as an ally, that is a warning of like, hey, you are looking to your former oppressors thinking like they can save you, but it's like th that nation brought pain to you. Why would you put your trust in them? But even in that, and part of the wonderful thing here is the Lord will bring discipline to Egypt, but he will also bring redemption. And so there's a lot going on in these passages that I think is uh, just really, really interesting and wonderful. Um, and so let's jump in. Uh, and I'm going to read all of 18 um, and then kind of talk about it. So uh, verse one. Woe to the land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush, which sends envoys by sea and papyrus boats over the water. Go, swift messengers, to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. All you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it, and when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. This is what the Lord says to me. I will remain quiet and I will look on from my dwelling place like a shimmering heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest for before the harvest, when the blossom is gone and the flower becomes a ripening grape, he will cut off the shoots with pruning knives and cut down and take away the spreading branches. They will all be left to the mountain birds of prey and to the wild animals. The birds will feed on them all summer, the wild animals all winter. At that time, gifts we brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, 
whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. So this uh, first message, I, this burden, this prophecy is to the nation of Cush. And Cush is uh, most likely the region that we now call Ethiopia. So to the south of Egypt um, and still a part of this, this Nile complex of nations. And, and so at the time, uh, Cush is growing in power um, and they are making moves against the Egyptians. And the Egyptians are actually in a uh, kind of a political tailspin uh, at this time anyway. Um, because the Assyrians are fighting against them, the Philistines are fighting against them, everybody's fighting with Egypt, um, and Cush is like, now's our chance. And so this uh, land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush, like this is part of all these tributaries coming off the Nile, and the whirring wings, people are thinking, oh, is it, are these locusts? Um, and maybe there's a lot of locusts, but one of the things that uh, several commentaries pointed out as well is, we are talking about messengers going up and down the river. And one of the ways that people talked about sails is they referred to them as wings um, because wings like sails catch air. And so these whirring wings as the people are going up and down the river, um, they're using sails and oar to travel. Um, and, uh, and so this land that is dominated by uh, river transportation like send a message to these folks. And so these swift messengers that they're talking about, that's another one of those questions. Like, who are they referring to? Tall and smooth skinned. Uh, that could be the Ethiopians, but there also are some folks who say, this could be the Assyrians um, that are, because they have different speech. They, they, they are uh, foreign to the people of Israel. Um, but I'm leaning more towards Cush. Like you're sending messages to Cush to try to get help. Right. And so he's saying, hey, go swift messengers, send the things, but you should all know. Uh, and the, the message here is like, there will be a cutting down of Cush. And the um, and the Lord is watching all of this happen. As he said, like, I'm, I'll watch from my my throne in, in my 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 palace, essentially. Um, and I will watch all of this happen. But he's he talks about the cutting the the bloom in time. And this is a agricultural uh, metaphor. Um, and so with grapes and different vine uh, plants, there, are, there were several different times to prune throughout the year. And so like he's saying, like, I know the right time to prune Cush, to cut down this nation that could become a powerhouse, a threat to my own people. Uh, and you should know, I will do this. <laughs> like the Lord is saying, I will cut them down. Um, and so don't put your hope in them and don't look to them as your salvation against this, this empire from the East that's coming against you, but trust the Lord. But even in this message is saying like, I will cut them down uh, at, at the end uh, in verse seven, he comes back to that message. Uh, Gifts will be brought to the Lord almighty from a people tall and smooth skin from a people who far and wide an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. That's the exact same language that we have in verse two. Like the very same people who uh, are these strange, these strangers who you're looking to for hope. Like they're also eventually, they will bring their treasures, their gifts to worship the Lord. And, and so there's this message here of God's desire to bring the Cushites into his family. And one of the things that we have uh, as, as followers of Jesus, we may have a, um, a bias to look to the New Testament as the only time where the Lord was concerned with Gentiles. But the Old Testament is giving that message as well. Like we see that God wants to bring the nations into his family. And, and so we, um, we should not look at, at God's desire as something that changed after Jesus died, but that it was a consistent plan for God. Like I, he always wanted the nations to be brought into his family and his primary 
uh, strategy in the Old Testament to, to show the goodness of God was the nation of Israel. But Israel disobeyed. Israel was supposed to be a light on the hill that would show what it means to be blessed by the Lord and to walk in his favor. And from and in walking in his favor, then the nations around them would say, This is this is the good life that we should follow as well. Let's serve Yahweh. And so here we're getting this message of the nations that they still have a place. And so um, so yeah, so even in knowing that Cush is going to be cut down, the people, the descendants of uh the Cushites, the Lord has a place for them in his family as well. And they will bring their gifts. And I, I think that is an important thing just to highlight. And especially as we continue on, because uh, we'll see a similar message in Egypt, um, that, that God has a place for the Gentiles. And he wants the nations uh, to be a part of his family. So, uh, yeah, so that's the, the, the burden uh, for the people of Cush. And recognizing that these... Um, these efforts to reach out to assistance from the other nations, those are futile uh, because those other nations will fail as well. Um, and so don't put your hope in those alliances. And, um, and so the part of what the, the message for the people of Jerusalem and Judah in particular, as the Northern kingdom is falling apart while Isaiah's ministry is happening for the kingdom of Judah, they need to put their hope in the Lord alone over and over again that's going to be the message and then we have so the immediate message trust the lord and then we have a future uh hope of reconciliation between the lord uh and the people of israel and the nations so um so let's look at what's going on then in chapter 19 and 20 um and these really are um a, a piece 19 and 20 are are should be united together. And just as a reminder, all the chapters and the verse numbers, Isaiah didn't put those in there. All right. Other people did to just try to help us find stuff. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're very distracting. And so this is one of those times where 19 and 20 should probably just be one verse or one chapter. Um, and so the way this is broken down uh, is there's two main sections uh, that are presented. And so the first is 19, one through 15, which is uh, looking at how God will defeat Egypt and her gods. And if, if we're remembering the story, then we need to go back and say, oh, he already did that. In the Exodus event, uh, the plagues were a, um, were an attack against the gods of Egypt. And so each plague corresponded with one of the pantheon of egypt and the lord was was displaying his authority over all of those and so uh, like the the darkness the plague of darkness one of the chief gods in the egyptian pantheon was was ra the the the, the, the god son or the son of the the god of the sun and you know it's like so those kinds of things where he's the lord is saying no not even your most powerful god matters like i have power over that and so this passage, as uh, as the Lord is giving these messages, he's talking about defeating all of Egypt again, but it's not just the the gods and the pantheon, but it's the leadership, uh, they're like civil war, economic disaster, bad leadership. But then also the next section, we look at how God will save Egypt and they will worship him. And so the first section is poetic. It's a song. And then the second section, and your translations probably have this as like paragraphs instead of like poetry. So it's intended to be read as prose um, uh, and not as a poem. And in that second section, it really does look at how the Lord's going to, even though Egypt will fall, God's not done with Egypt. And he also has a place for them in his family, which is just so wonderful because when we Think about Egypt. Most of the time, it's like Egypt is bad. Don't go back to Egypt. Uh, don't lean on Egypt for your rescue. But Egypt itself, the nation needs to learn to lean on Yahweh for rescue um, because he has a place for them. And so when we think about Jesus's message to uh, forgive our, uh, those who 
bring harm to us, right? In the Sermon on the Mount. So when he strikes you, turn the other cheek. Uh, to love your enemies. These kinds of messages, this is, this is the message of this chapter. There is, if God can love Egypt, then we as followers of the Lord should also have room in our heart for the people of Egypt. Um, and so this is, again, there is a, an immediate message for the people to, um, to not look to Egypt because Egypt is going to fall. And the Lord is overseeing all of this. But then also a, a future hope of reconciliation, reconciliation and redemption for Egypt. And so in the, the, these sections, we have immediate thing and future, immediate thing and future. Uh, and so we're going back and forth, which is fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we will see then in chapter 20, uh, Isaiah is going to be uh, called by the Lord to demonstrate Egypt's fall in a pe peculiar way. And so that's kind of the, the, the outline for chapters 19 and 20. Um, and so let's uh, jump in here. And I'm going to read the first 15 verses of chapter 19 just so we can get the, the scope of it. Um, a prophecy against Egypt, so a warning or a burden uh, for Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. And they will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The waters of the river will dry up, and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will, st will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Also, the plants along the Nile, at the mouth of the river, every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament. All who cast hooks into the Nile, those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Those who work with the combed flax will despair. The weavers of fine linen will lose hope. The workers in cloth will be dejected, and the, all the wage earners will be sick at heart. The officials of Zon are nothing but fools. The wise counselors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings? Where are your wise men now? Let them show you and make known what the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. The officials of Zon have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her people have led Egypt astray. The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness, and they make Egypt stagger in all that she does as drunkard staggers around in his vomit. There is nothing Egypt can do, head or tail, palm branch or reed. I do love uh, the, the imagery that we're given here. Uh, at the end, the leaders are so foolish. So they're given over to this, this spirit of drunkenness and dizziness, and they stagger, they vomit. And they are covered in their own puke, and they're going around going, "I'm a wise man." That's that's what Isaiah is communicating to us. Like, really, <laughs> you want that guy to be your wise man? Um, so, um, so here we have in in the first section, the Lord coming on a swift cloud, and part of the the imagery uh, that that we should capture is the Canaanite religion. Uh, was uh, very em em emphasized Baal. And Baal was often pictured on a swift cloud and a powerful storm God. And so here the Lord is saying, he's nothing. Like the clouds are my chariot. And so here I come into Egypt um, against the people of Egypt and the idols are trembling. And for, as we continue to read through Isaiah, when we think about idols, Isaiah knows the idols are nothing, right? They're just things that people make with their hands. And so the, the, the statues um, can't really tremble on their own. And so he's going beyond the idols of the statues and saying the spirits behind these idols 
they, they recognize the authority of the Lord. They recognize that when, when Yahweh turns his attention toward you, uh, that's usually bad news for these dark forces, for these demonic spirits. And so they're trembling. And, they, and for the people of Egypt who have placed their hope in all of these different idols, uh, then they are left trembling as well because they can't, um, they, they can't uh, call on the idols to do anything because they're too afraid. The idols themselves are too afraid. And so with this, when, when, when religion uh, stops working, people start turning on other people. And part of, part of the tension, as we read through these passages, we are not Egypt, we are not Israel, but human nature continues over and over again. And so one, one of the things that we see right now in our own country is a rejection of, uh, of shared values, a rejection of, uh, of, uh, of the gospel in our country. And instead of the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ, we have turned towards the gospel of capitalism, the gospel of conservatism, the gospel of liberalism. We've turned to all these other gospels that people are holding on to. And those have now become our, our religions in our own nation. And so our, our confidence in, in, in a greater story of the Lord is gone. And so we look to these other idols, and they're not working for people. I don't know if, I don't know if we've all seen this, but people are miserable. And so when we look at the division in our own country right now, where people can't even talk to people, who have different political views. Like we can't even, like I can't even look at them. They make me sick. Like this is because our, our idols are failing us. And, and so we are turning toward turning against one another. And so the same thing that's happening here in this passage in Egypt, like we see this happening in our, in our culture now. And the warning for the people of Jerusalem and the warning that I would, pray for us as followers of Jesus today is uh, get rid of the idols and start talking to people in, in grace and in love and, and in truth, but recognizing that, that if there's room for the Egyptians in the family of God, there's room for Republicans, there's room for Democrats, there's room. And if we are only going to fight against each other, then we will reap the whirlwind of garbage that will not uh, benefit anybody. And, and so we just need to be mindful. Like these passages should be wake ups to us. Like, Oh, look, these people are fighting against each other. Why their idols are failing them. And why are people fighting against each other? Now their idols are failing them. They've looked to their politics or their, their success or their pleasure or their leisure, whatever the idol is. And it's like, that's ah, not working. So I got to blame somebody. I'll blame my neighbor. And so we fight. Um, and so that's what's happening here in this passage. There's, it's turning towards a civil war. And, um, and then they start, instead of going to their, their idols and their, the state religions of the idols, and then like fighting against each other, they start looking to necromancy here, like worshiping the dead and looking for um, like rogue spiritism, essentially. And even then, the, the mediums and the spiritists, uh, they are not going to be helpful in that situation. And so, like, Egypt is going down a bad road here. Um, and so when we are remembering these empires looking so powerful, they all fall. They all fail. Every empire fails. Um, and so the Lord is going to hand the Egyptians over to uh, a cruel master, and that's going to be the Assyrians. And the Assyrians will come and actually rule over the Egyptians as well. And, and this is all like going to happen. And this is one of those events in, um, in archaeology where uh, they, like, we can like date these things happening. And there's many uh, exterior sources outside of the Bible that say, yeah, all this happened. The Assyrians were really good at keeping records of how awesome they were. Um, so much like Instagram today, look at this great lunch I made. 
And then uh, that was the Assyrians with their their records. They were really very uh, intense on on this stuff. And so um, so he's going to hand them over, and the the very life force of the of all of Egypt comes down to the Nile River. And Lee and Pat are on the are, are in Egypt right now. They they went on the Nile River, and I'm super jealous because it's amazing. Um, to it's an amazing experience. And so like being like the this river is is huge. And it's really long, and it brings life all the way to uh, through the whole nation, um, all along the riverbanks. And when the se- the the seasons when the the Nile floods is actually a huge benefit because it stirs up all this silt that goes out into the tributaries and onto the the land um, that that has all kinds of nutrients for the plants. Uh, and so flooding in of the Nile was a massive benefit. It was super helpful and people depended upon it. And it was, it was one of those things that was super predictable too. They knew when it was going to happen um, because rain was so infrequent um, that they, they needed this. And so what the Lord is saying is like, I'm going to dry the river up. And that's, that, that's bad news. If the river isn't flooding, then there is no life in the Nile. There is no life in that region. And so all of these plants and the flax and the fish and all the stuff that the the people of Egypt depended upon for their livelihood, that's all going to be reduced and removed. Um, and and so the 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 grief of the of the of the people along the Nile is going to be pronounced um, as we see all of this. And so, um, yeah. So the the flax linen like was like a major export and it's made from flax reeds as they dry it out and strip it. And it's a whole process. Um, but yeah, so they are going to have a, a tremendous economic hardship that's going to come because the river will dry up. Um, and then again, the officials, the leaders in these different major cities will be idiots, just the worst. They won't like they won't agree on anything. They they won't be able to give good advice, um, and they will continually do dumb, stupid things. So, politics have been the same for all of time. <laughs> Every politician is like I read this like I know I know I've read about people like this um, just recently. Uh, so the the message here is don't trust Egypt. Don't trust these barf covered people who say i'm wise don't trust them they're they're fools uh and so there's nothing that it, it, egypt can do uh to to correct this this trend that they are heading down but then we get this in that day uh, a, a series of in that days here where the lord is now looking to a future after these um these things come about for egypt there is a future day where there's going to be uh, continued destruction leading to ref- repentance and reformation. And so um, so that's kind of what's happening in 16 and following. Uh, so let's look at that. In that day, the Egyptians will become weaklings. Now, there is a uh, translation issue here that I need to point out. Um, because the Hebrew, and this is, this is not me. <laughs> okay uh the the hebrew actually says they will be like women and that's strong language here but it like the the imagery is like uh i know there are many strong and independent women in the world but like right now if there's a spider in my house my my wife and my daughter are dead <laughs> right like that's that's the image that that the lord is giving to us here like there's a spider in Egypt and they're dead. All right. They're, what are we going to do? Like I, we, they're paralyzed with, with fear. Uh, they will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord almighty raises against them. And the land of Judah will bring terror on the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord almighty is planning against them. Now, this is a great reversal because Judah right now is terrified. They're overwhelmed with the, uh, the possibility that all these empires might come against them. And what the Lord is promising is like, there's a day where Egypt will be afraid of you because they will know that the Lord is on your side. 
And so in that day, they will be afraid. Uh, in that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of the sun. And so here we have this speaking the language of Canaan. This is speaking Hebrew in Egypt. And how is that happening? Is the people of Egypt are like, either there's a exodus of Egyptians or of uh, people from Judah moving down to Egypt. And that will happen with the exile. People will flee down to Egypt, but they won't like have the kind of influence to change the language of a city. You know, right now we, you know, with like migration in the world, like um, there are places along the, the Southern border where Spanish is more commonly spoken than English. Like that's what's happening is like, but here it's not like just a migration. It's like, what are we going to do with all these people? These people are choosing to say, we want to be like you. We want to speak your language um, and uh, be called the city of the sun. And sun is one of those things uh, as well in this, uh, where there's some questions on different ver different texts uh, that could actually be the city of destruction. Um, and so it's just a mystery there. Like what's going on here? I'm not totally sure. And even in the commentaries, they're like, uh, we don't know. Uh, just turn the page, go to the next page. Uh, so um, verse 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When, the cry, when they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressor, he will send them a savior and defender and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And in that day, they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offering they will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. So here, like looking at the big picture of scripture, the Lord hears the cries of the oppressed over and over again. We see that. And one of the places that we see that most prominently is in Exodus. But in that story, it's the cries of the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, who cry out because they are being oppressed by the Egyptians. In this passage, the Lord hears the cries of the oppressed, but it's not the people of Israel. It's the people of Egypt. He hears the cries of the oppressed, and he will come and rescue them, and they will set up a monument to the Lord. They, this is a radical conversion for the nation of Egypt to Christianity, or not Christianity, I'm playing my cards a little bit, uh, to uh, following, uh, following Yahweh. And, um, you know, having, having been to Egypt, it is a, you know, Muslim country, uh, and it is uh, everywhere you go, there are mosques and, um, uh, you know, yeah, it's just crazy. But at the same time, when the the call to prayer happens, I thought, just based on movies and my own ignorance, I thought the call to prayer happens, everybody stops to pray. They don't. <laughs> the call, the, you know, five times a day, there's a call to prayer, and most of the city just keeps moving. It's really only on Friday and really only at noon that the mosques are full. And, uh, and so the, there's a civil religion that's happening in Egypt, but it is not necessarily... Like everybody is passionate about Islam. And, and so while we look at in the time that Isaiah is, is giving this message, like the, the worship of the Egyptian pantheon is a big deal. Um, and they, there have been tremendous Christian influences uh, in history as well. Like the, the Library of Alexandria, there was a great Jewish influence uh, there. Uh, the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation of the New Testament, like that was those were scholars in Egypt, Hebrew scholars in Egypt that were translating to Greek. Um, you know, so there's like huge, there are these seasons of influence for the Lord in Egypt, but there hasn't been this massive transformation yet. And so this is one of those things where it's like, there will be a day when the nation of Egypt will cry out to Yahweh, not Allah, not Ra, not Ramses, not ISIS, not any of those, but to Yahweh. And, and so 
reading this is like, ah, oh, that would be wonderful. And I would love to see that um, because that's a, a massive gospel transformation. Uh, so the Lord will rescue them. They'll cry out to him and they will rescue them. Uh, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. And so not just, this is like, where like people hearing this probably their brains exploded because it's like, wait, 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 wait. You just told me that the people of Cush, they're going to have a place in the kingdom of God. And now you're telling me the people of Egypt they're going to be rescued by Yahweh. And now the people of Assyria who are actively attacking us, they're also going to worship together with the Egyptians. And there's going to be this highway, which is a, uh, in, our, in, our, in our country, like the interstate actually like divided and broke up a lot of different communities. Um, but it also connected us from, from Bellingham to San Diego, right? It made it so easy to travel um, and, and so this is part of the message here is like these roads bring people together and, uh, there's an opportunity to do what seems impossible because of the highway and, um, even the, the spread of the gospel in, in the new Testament, one of the key factors that made it possible for, for Paul to get to all these different places, like he sailed to places, but then he walked around <laughs> like the highway made it possible for the message of the gospel to leave Ephesus and go out into the rest of Turkey. You know, like that kind of highway system, like it, the Hebrew people didn't make that. The Romans did as a way of like trying to exert their dominance. And the Lord's like, I'll use that. I'll use that. And even now we talk about the internet as the information super highway, right? Like that was one of the big metaphors when it was first being developed. And it's like, you know, this thing can actually unite people. Right now, it can also be used to hurt and oppress people. And for the for followers of Jesus, we should be looking for ways to make uh, unity roads uh, of the gospel. And what seems impossible is possible if we surrender these things to the Lord. And so in that day, the Egyptians and the Syrians are going to travel back and forth. They're not going to be at war with one another. They're going to worship the Lord together. And that is cool. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egyptian and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Wow. Those are, that's crazy. I, you got, yo, those are all words that, that the Lord only used for Israel. Israel was his people. Israel was his handy work. Israel was his inheritance. But now he's saying, Egypt is my people. Assyria will be my people. And Israel, my, my, they're mine. They're mine. All these, these power players in the region, in the world, the Lord's saying, they're all my people. And I want all of them to be a part of my family. And there will be a day. And so in this, this message of, of, of warning, of destruction, like all of that destruction ultimately is in the purpose is to bring humility to the people, to these empires, to stop trying to trust in their idols, to stop trying to trust in the power of, uh, of, of their military strength, but to trust in the Lord. And there will be a day. There will be a day. And, uh, yeah, I, as I was preparing for this, I was just so delighted that like, we could see that <laughs> we could see that day. Um, and you know, I'm not like rushing for the Lord to return and, uh, on all this to come to, to pass, like, I, cause you know, there's pain along the way for that too. But, um, even if it doesn't happen in our natural lifetime, we spend eternity with God. We will see these things happen. These ancient enemies being called the people of God. I love that. I love it. And someday it will happen. But in the meantime, so now verse chapter 20, we have a hard shift uh, and we kick it back into reverse um, because uh, before all that happens, some hardship has to happen. And so verse 20, uh, in the year... In the year that supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, and we have dates for all of those things from the Assyrian records, 
uh, at that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. He said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and, and barefoot. And so he's wearing sackcloth uh, because sackcloth is a, uh, a, a garment for mourning. And so we're not really told when he started wearing sackcloth, but he was wearing it apparently, and he's mourning for something. Uh, and uh, then the Lord says, take that off and walk around. Uh, and so he did. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years. Uh, so we're told in the first paragraph, do this. We're not told how long. And Isaiah is just like, okay. <laughs> and so then verse three, doing this for three years uh, as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush. So the king of Assyria will lead the, away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old with buttocks bared the Egyptians uh, to Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. In that day, the people who live on, the, on this coast will say, see what has happened to those we relied on, those we fled to, to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. How then can we escape? And so this message that's been kind of consistently through uh, these oracles to the nations, um, as the people of, of Jerusalem are hearing this, don't trust them, don't trust them, don't put your hope in them. They are temporary. And now uh, Isaiah is like, let me show you what's going to happen to them. And he walks around naked for three years. And when people asked him, like, two years in, like, why are you doing this? And Isaiah said, the Lord told me to. And it's only after that three years where the Lord actually gives the explanation for what's happening here. That is faith. <laughs> <laughs> right that, that that's isaiah is obedient uh if nothing else so uh, but this message here is like look we put our hope in egypt and Cush, and they're carried off naked in chains uh ashamed and the 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 assyrians this is these are the kinds of things they did uh where when they took captives um they they humiliated them and so that's what's happening to the people of egypt and Cush. they're being humiliated uh and so uh, let's, uh, keep going to chapter 21 and, uh, I'm going to read through chapter or verse 10. Yeah. So a prophecy against Babylon. Um, and, uh, we have that as a heading and the, here it says the desert by the sea and, uh, in the NIV. And this is, uh, one of the ways that it, we could be referring to Babylon because the, the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates created a, a lot of marshiness into in the when it came down into the sea that it feeds out into Aqaba. Um, and so that the, it's a desert, but then also very marshy um, in this this region. So um so yeah, so we are pretty sure we're talking about Babylon here. Uh like whirlwinds sweeping through the Southland, an invader comes from the desert from a land of terror. A dire vision has been shown to me. The traitor betrays, the looter takes loot. Elam attack, media lay siege. I will bring to an end all the groaning she caused. At this, my body is racked with pain. Pang sees me like those of a woman in labor. I am staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. My heart falters. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I long for has become a horror to me. Um, I'll, I'll pause here because this is, this first person language is Isaiah talking about what he is seeing is going to happen um, to uh, the the people of Babylon, the, the nation of Babylon. And, and so he is, this is one of the ways that we know this is a burden because he is hurting physically. He is being affected by what he has seen uh, regarding what's coming to Babylon. And so his stomach is upset. He is overwhelmed. He is in pain, uh, like a woman in labor. Um, all of this, like it's, oh, it's too much. Um, and so that there's this horror that he is experiencing. And then it switches to verse five. Uh, they set tables, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink, get up you officers, oil the shields. And so this, they here is looking at, uh, but, most likely the people of Babylon and how they're responding to this coming invader. And so there are some who are setting table, spreading rugs, eating and drinking, while there are others who are saying, get up, prepare for battle. 
and oiling the shields is something that they would do to, because uh, the shields are usually uh, wrapped, like a wood wrapped in leather, and they would oil the leather on the shields so that it didn't crack. Um, and so it just made it a little bit stronger, but then also it made the leather shiny. So like if people were looking at it and the sun was on it, right, it would also be a, um, a defensive mechanism. So, uh, so some are partying and others are saying, we need to get ready, uh, for this battle. And this is what the Lord says, go post a lookout and have him, have him report what he sees when he sees chariots with teams of horses, riders on donkeys or riders on camels, let him be alert, fully alert. And the lookout shouted, so go watch, the, the battle is coming. And the lookout shouted, day after day, my Lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stay at my post. Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses. And he gives back the answer, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. My people who are crushed on the threshing floor, I tell you what I have heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. So Babylon, in this time, they are, so Assyria is the power player, but Babylon is trying to make a move. And there is a, a king, uh, Babadon, I think was his name. So Sargon II died, and uh, Merodach Baladan tried to set himself up as a new emperor uh, in Babylon, and uh, it did not go well. And so the, they, they are trying to make themselves a power player uh, to fight against the Assyrians in the, their moment of weakness, but they lose. They lose bad. And so this message of this, this chariot that's coming now as a watchtower to the people of Jerusalem is saying, Babylon's fallen, Babylon's fallen. And here again, this image of the idols uh, failing. They're smashed, they're broken, and the people are overwhelmed. And so the idols were trembling in Egypt. Uh, they were overwhelmed because the Lord was coming here. These idols are smashed because the Assyrians were like, nah, we are not, we're not going to even recognize the power of these things. And they destroyed these idols. Um, and so Isaiah is being given a vision of Babylon falling. And then he's communicating that to the people who are overwhelmed, the people on the, who are crushed on the threshing floor. Those are the people of Judah who feel worn out and, and defeated and like, where is our hope? And one more message, it's not in Babylon. It's not in Egypt, it's not in Assyria, it's not in Cush, it's not in Babylon. Um, and then in verse 11, we have a prophecy against Edom. Uh, and uh, in verse 11 it says, a prophecy against Dema. Uh, Someone calls to me from Seir, watchman, what is left of the night? Watchman, what is left of the night? The watchman replies, Morning is coming, but also the night. If you would ask, then ask and come back yet again. Um, and so here we have uh, the Edomites who, when Babylon does come, Edomites will rejoice. And they are going to wait for Jerusalem and Judah to be taken out, and they're going to rejoice. And so this may be a bit of a foretelling, um, saying like, here's this smaller nation that Judah has actually had um, influence over for a long time. But as Judah is shrinking in influence, Edom is growing and trying to wait. They're kind of waiting their turn to come and attack uh, Judah. And so what is the watchman saying is like, well, morning's coming, but night's coming too. And so uh, a little warning to say, don't look to Edom to save you because they're just waiting for night. They're just waiting to come against you. Um, and so, and they will also be, um, they're going to go through their own uh, challenges as well with all these empires switching over. Um, and so, yeah, they are small in, in, in the world events um, as they are going to be poured out. And then a prophecy against Arabia. So if you're thinking Saudi Arabia, that's exactly what we should be thinking, like that region. Uh, a prophecy against Arabia, you caravans of Dedanites, who camp in the thickets of Arabia? Bring water for the thirsty. You who live in Tama, bring food for the fugitives. They flee from the sword, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the heat of battle. This is what the Lord says to me. Within one year, as a servant bound by contract would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will come to an end. The survivors of the 
of the archers, the warriors of Kedar, Kedar will be few. The Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. And so, you know, they're calling out to these, like the Bedouin caravan type people um, saying like, you have something that you can help us with. And they're calling out, bring water, bring food. Um, and, uh, and they might respond, but also even those folks, there is a temporariness to these city states, these empire, like these small little kingdoms in Arabia, the Bedouin communities, all of this, they will also have a, an experience of downfall 